This is a quick guide to the Depau du Sein racing monoplanes of the late pre-World War I period. When I put together my presentation on the Bristol M1 monoplane fighter, I observed that it was in general layout similar to pre-World War I racing monoplanes, and for a good reason. As form follows function, the pursuit of speed resulted in generally similar aircraft, that is, sleek, for the time, monoplanes with bracing wires to provide strength and stability to the single wing. More than this, the appearance of this aircraft made me think something along the lines of, oh, where have I seen this aircraft before? After much searching, I found it, or more correctly, them. They were the Depardusin 1912 racing monoplane and its successor, the Depardusin monocoque. Both were ground-breaking and award-winning aircraft and highly successful in their roles as racers. A quick guide to Depardusin will have to wait for another video, but in brief, Aeroplan Depardusin was established by Armand Depardusin in 1911. Armand himself was a businessman rather than an aircraft designer. His technical director and chief designer was Louis Becherot. In 1912, the company was renamed Société de Production des Aeroplans Depardusin. Initial aircraft were quite successful, but despite this, Armand went bankrupt in 1913 and arrested for fraud. Remaining incarcerated until his trial in 1917, he was found guilty and sentenced to five years imprisonment, but as this was his first offence, he was reprieved and released. Given that it had taken four years to get to trial, he had basically served his sentence. He committed suicide in 1924. In his absence, the company went into administration, and the name changed to Société Provisoire des Aeroplans Depardusin, better known as SPAD. The company's assets were acquired by a consortium led by Louis Blériot, and reorganized as Société pour l'Aviation et ses Dérivés, retaining the SPAD acronym. SPAD, of course, leads little introduction, and went on to considerable success during World War I, producing some of the best aircraft of the conflict. It was fully integrated into Blériot's organization in 1921. Louis Becherot remained the chief designer throughout, and much of the success of the aircraft can be attributed to him, including the legendary SPAD-13. Frankly, he too deserves a video of his own. With some groundwork laid down, Back to the subjects of this video. In a surprisingly short time, if it can be said that Depardusin was famous for a particular type of aircraft, it was monoplanes. They produced a plethora of types with a carrying capacity of between one and three, and float planes. Some were for military trials and equipped with an observer's position, requiring the occupant, when manning a machine gun, to stand rather precariously. This was not too unusual for the time, and endured into early World War I. Photographic evidence of restraining belts does little to reduce the hair-raising impression of these installations. Showing a general, and unsurprising, family similarity, typical engines utilized were Gnome, Anzani, and Clergé, ranging in power from 30 to 160 horsepower. Just about every pre-war French aircraft seems to have used one of these. Development of the first aircraft in this video occurred with remarkable rapidity. At this point, I have to depart from my usual practice. When researching, I try not to use Wikipedia except for the references. On this occasion, my usual sources are surprisingly light on details, and it turns out the best accumulation of information I could find was Wikipedia. However, given extensive references to Flight Magazine, I have elected to conditionally trust the information given in the articles. I wasn't able to follow up with back issues of Flight Magazine because that online resource was being reorganized at the time that I wrote this script. The first of these two aircraft is currently known as the Depardusin 1912 racing monoplane. It was designed by Louis Becherot built in 1911, and probably flown late that year or early in 1912. 
In some respects, it was a conventional racing monoplane, if such a thing is possible this early in the history of powered flight. However, much attention was paid to streamlining. The fuselage was of a box girder design, which is not unusual, but entirely covered with laminations of plywood in a stressed skin construction pioneered by Swiss engineer Eugene Luchonet. Extremely advanced for its time, a stressed skin construction has its compression taking elements localized and the tension taking elements distributed. This is a form of build that is in common use even today, so its appearance in 1912 can only be called revolutionary. Reducing the normal bird's nest of wires that accompanies early monoplanes, the wing warping control wires were internal to the carbane struts. Additionally, and illustrating the dedication to reducing drag, the tail skid was arranged so that the springing was internal to the fuselage and the spoked wheels had disc coverings. The prop was made by the legendary Lucien Chauvier, whose propellers went on to be used in a quarter of the Allied aircraft flown during World War I. Initially powered by a 100 horsepower Gnome Double Omega, it is likely that this engine was in use during early fast flights when piloted by Jules Vedrine. However, it was replaced by a more powerful 140 horsepower Gnome Double Lambda. On 22nd of February 1912, Monsieur Vedrine pushed the aircraft to an average speed of 105 miles per hour over 120 miles, making it the first aircraft to exceed 100 miles per hour. Despite its success, this aircraft was probably intended to be experimental. That's my interpretation, as Louis Becherot immediately went on to put together an even more revolutionary and significantly faster design. Once again, Becherot borrowed from Eugene Rouchonnet and implemented a genuine monocoque construction in which the load bearing box girder was dispensed with, that requirement being replaced by the skin of the aircraft. The laminated shell was made in two halves from tulip wood, the internal fittings installed, and the two halves glued together. As before, every effort was made to reduce drag, and propellers manufactured by Lucien Chauvier were once more utilized. A spinner was fitted over the hub, and a 160 horsepower Gnome Lambda Lambda provided the power. The results were well worth the effort. In both 1912 and 1913, these aircraft won the Gordon Bennett Trophy. The pilots were Jules Vedrine and Maurice Prévost, respectively, and in the latter instance, an average speed of 124.77 miles per hour was recorded. Given the similarities of these two aircraft and the Bristol M1, it is tempting to wonder to what extent the designer of the latter, Frank Barnwell, was inspired by the former. Frankly, I'm going to have to leave the conjecture up to you, the listener, because I simply don't know, and we can't really get inside Mr. Barnwell's head. As stated at the beginning, form follows function, so some similarity is inevitable. An example of the Depardieu Saint monocoque is on display at the French Air and Space Museum at Le Bourget near Paris.